So this, uh, this human rights system in the Americas, all of the countries in the Americas belong to the Organization of American States with the exception of Cuba. So all of the other countries in the Americas are members. The, um, under the Organization of American States, there's two bodies that, that uh, have responsibility to oversee human rights. There's the body that we're currently before, which is the Inter-American Commission. And there's also an Inter-American Court. The court has jurisdiction over countries that have signed on to um, the covenant. The covenant? <laughs> the convention. The convention on human rights. But Canada hasn't signed on to that treaty. So therefore, as Canadians, you do not have the right to appear before the Inter-American Court. We only have the right to go to the Inter-American Commission. So, you know, one of the areas I think that needs to be seriously looked at is, you know, should Canada sign on to that document? And as Canadians, do we feel that that is something that should happen? The Inter-American Court made this statement that if a state signs and ratifies an international treaty, especially one concerning human rights, it has the obligation to make every effort to comply with the recommendations. And in this particular case, they were talking about the Inter-American Commission. So, you know, one of the one of the first issues that, that we'll be dealing with is, you know, Canada's um, Reaction. So in our case, we've now, we've now, um, we've now gotten to the point where we're hope, you know, we're expecting a decision, and that decision by the Inter-American Commission, it will be up to Canada to decide how they're going to deal with it. The Commission does not have the jurisdiction to force Canada to do anything. So, you know, this statement by the court is that when a country signs on to a treaty, an international treaty, especially one that deals with human rights, they have an obligation to make every effort to comply with that commitment. Now, when we think of human rights, you know, do we think of Canada as a country with some very major human rights problems? Or, or do we think that things are pretty good here? That we really don't have any significant human rights problems? And the government of Canada is pretty good about pointing fingers, you know, at other countries. You know, this country, this country, this country has human rights problems. I would say that within Canada, the issue of First Nations and First Nations conditions is in fact a very major human rights problem. You know, when you travel to a reserve, you don't have to ask any questions as to whether you're on a reserve or not. It's very apparent. When you look at the statistics, you know, First Nations people are high in all of the bad statistics and low in all of the good statistics. So, you know, when we think about human rights, and when we think about human rights within our own country, you know, we don't need to, to think that there are, there are not, in fact, major human rights concerns here. The duty of uh, Organization of American States member states is to promote and protect human rights stems from the human rights obligations established in the OAS Charter and the American Declaration uh, on the Rights and Duties of Man establishes a series of state obligations to promote and secure the effective enjoyment of human rights. So, 
the Hulkaminum leadership made the decision that we would go the international route, that we were not satisfied that the domestic system would be able to deal effectively with our issues. The Inter-American Commission recently re, uh, released this report. It's uh, the indigenous and tribal people's rights uh, over their traditional lands and natural resources, the norms and jurisprudence of the inter-American human rights system. For those of you that have a, an interest in this area, it's a great report, it's online. Um, I think it will give you a fairly good idea of the difference between the approach. The approach of the domestic legal system and the approach of the international legal system and how different they are. Before the Inter-American Commission, Canada challenged us on admissibility. So one of the requirements of going before an international body like this is that you have to uh, exhaust all of your domestic legal remedies, which means that you have to go to court in your home country before you can go to the international forum. One of the, uh, there is a, an exception, and the exception is if the commission is satisfied that there are no adequate, effective, available domestic remedies. That's the test. If you can satisfy that test, then you can go to the Inter-American Commission without going to court in your home country. The Hulkaminum did not file one document um, with respect to this in a Canadian court. We completely bypassed the Canadian legal system. So Canada argued that, well, you know, the, the petition should not be heard, should not be heard by the Commission due to the fact that they argued that, in fact, there were available, adequate, effective domestic remedies. Canada argued that the Hulkaminum could go to court in Canada. They argued that we're in the treaty process and we might be able to achieve a treaty. The counter argument that we put forward was, well, <clears throat> you know, um, there has not been one court in Canada, as I said, that has recognized First Nations title. There has not been one court in Canada that has ordered Canada to um, establish that title legally and that we've been in the treaty process now for 20 years, almost, that the vast majority of First Nations in British Columbia have not been able to reach agreement with the government on this issue, and that the government comes to the treaty tables which, with such predetermined outcomes, such predetermined mandates and policies, that it makes it impossible to reach agreement. So we argued that, in fact, we met the test. As part of our, our work that we did uh, in taking this forward, we reached out to other First Nations because we knew that we were not the only First Nation that had this experience. And so within that system, um, there are other individuals or organizations that are able to uh, file what is called amicus curiae briefs, friends of the court. All of these nations filed amicus curiae briefs in support. All of those nations and organizations all said the same thing. All had the same experiences all had the same problems and, and all of that evidence was led before the Inter-American Commission. We had support right across British Columbia, we had support from the Nunavut, we had support from, uh, from the, uh, the AFN in, in Ottawa, 
um, uh, from many, many uh, areas. And then we reached out and were able to gather support from human rights NGOs, from Amnesty International, from Lawyers Rights Watch Canada, who also filed amicus curiae briefs in support. With all of that, the Inter-American Commission made a ruling on admissibility. And these are some of their comments. They said, by failing to resolve the Hulkaminum claims with regard to their ancestral lands, the British Columbia Treaty Commission process has demonstrated that it is not an effective mechanism to protect the right to property alleged by the HDG. Very significant statement. The second, that there is no due process of law to protect the property rights of the Hulkaminum to its ancestral lands. Now that one ought to shock you. You know, you would, you would think that in Canada, that in fact there is an effective due process of law. We've got courts, we've got judges, we've got lawyers. But the commission said no, they were not satisfied that there was in fact an effective due process of law. The, uh, they stated the Canadian court cases on Aboriginal title do not seem to provide any reasonable expectations of success because Canadian jurisprudence has not obligated the state, that is Canada, to set boundaries, to demarcate, and record title deeds to lands of Indigenous peoples. And therefore, in the case of the Halkaminum, those remedies would not be effective under recognized general principles of international law. So the Inter-American Commission agreed with us. They agreed that there's a serious problem in Canada. And they, they said that they would, they would move forward with our case to the next stage. So the next stage was the hearing on the merits. And um, we have, we have uh, concluded our arguments on the merits. Canada has concluded their arguments on the merits and we're now waiting for a decision. So what the commission said is that they're going to, they're going to assess this on the basis of, of the following human rights violations. And these are human rights violations under the American inter, uh, the inter-American uh, system on human rights. So primarily the Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. They said that that's a treaty. That's an international treaty and that Canada has international obligations under that treaty to observe these rights. The right to equality. And uh, Lawyers Rights Watch did a great job of putting forward uh, arguments on the issue of the right to equality. They demonstrated in their arguments how, you know, the government recognizes the rights of non-First Nations people to property, recognizes their title deeds, but does not do the same for First Nations people. The right to profess, manifest, and practice a religious faith. This is in relation to um, a very specific Hulkaminum issue. Um, in our culture, our ancestors are, are very much a part of the culture. They, they, they make part of the fabric of our culture. Many, many obligations that people have to their ancestors. And, you know, so the dead become very much a part of the, of the living people's beliefs. And one of the, the real strong teachings is that you do not disturb the place where the dead are put to rest. 
And in our territory, one of the big issues is the fact that um, in development, many, many, many places are being disturbed on a regular basis. And we have fought on that issue. We have said, why is it that the government of British Columbia recognizes and in fact has a law, the Cemeteries Act, that prohibits people from engaging in activities that disturb burial places to the point where you can't even, you know, you can't discharge a firearm, you can't ride a motor vehicle in there, you can't play games in there or anything. And in fact, if anybody disturbs a cemetery, there's a fairly large backlash. You'll recall, you know, when people went in and tipped those headstones over. You know, people were upset about that. We said, well, we deserve the same respect. We deserve the same respect about our people that are buried. But the government does not recognize that. So that's one of the rights that we brought forward. The right to culture. The right to property. So the Inter-American Commission is in the process right now of assessing whether Canada has in fact breached our rights. If they have breached our human rights, then how will that get rectified? This is the first case from Canada to make it this far. I believe ours is the first case that's been brought forward dealing with indigenous land rights. And now, you know, we simply are waiting on a decision. And we hope that we'll have a decision soon, but we don't know. We don't know how soon that will come. So in terms of next steps, you know, implementation is, is going to be a, a vital part of this. If there's a positive decision from the Inter-American Commission, if in fact they say, yes, we agree, that there in fact has been a violation of Halkomena people's rights. And the Inter-American Commission has already made rulings on indigenous land rights from uh, Nicaragua, from Belize, from um, Paraguay, and other countries, primarily in Latin America, and in very similar situations to the one that the Halkomena find themselves in. In one of the cases, uh, I think it was the Saramaki case, they said that, you know, if a state confiscates indigenous people's lands, which we say they did, they have an international obligation. They either have to return those lands, or they have to replace those lands, or they have to make compensation for those lands. That's their international legal obligation. So if Canada, if, if the Inter-American Commission makes a positive ruling in our favor, then it will be up to Canada to implement it. And as I say, they could decide to ignore it. They could decide that they're not going to comply because they have no, uh, no mechanisms of implementation. So as Canadians, I think what you need to understand is that in terms of human rights and human rights obligations under the international legal system, Canada does not have any effective mechanisms to implement that. There's no Canadian legislation to implement the Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. So it all becomes very... Um, much a question of discretion of the government in power. And the protection of human rights in Canada becomes a question of the discretion of the government in power. They could decide, you know, to violate whatever human rights if, if in fact, they can ignore the Hulk, you know, if Hulkamina people get a positive decision and choose to ignore it, 
then presumably they could choose to ignore anybody's human rights. Again, we have Amnesty International and other human rights organizations that are supporting us. We have other human uh, First Nations supporting us. But we feel that it is necessary to build the knowledge of and the credibility of the Inter-American Commission. The comments that we got from the government to one of our chiefs is, what are you doing appearing before that obscure group in Washington? So, you know, we, we, you know, what we're trying to do through sessions like this is to make it very difficult for Canada to simply ignore a decision. The more educated the public is, the more educated the law profession is, the more educated the judges are, the more educated the lawyers are, the more educated the organizations that, that have an interest in human rights are, the better the prospect of having a proper implementation of any decision um, uh, and, and so, you know, that's why we've committed ourselves uh, to doing these kind of forums. So any information, uh, for further information, we have a website. We have two websites, www.hulkaminum.bc.ca and www.hdg-humanrights.bc.ca. And we're also on Facebook under Hall Communum Treaty. So that is, is uh, really what we're trying to accomplish. Um, why we've gone outside of Canada. Why we're seeking justice elsewhere. And uh, some of the issues that we're trying to uh, bring forward. So I guess with that, um, I, think, uh, I think there's probably time for questions. and. Uh, um, I'm not sure what, how much time we have. <laughs>